questions, how are my investments affecting the way food is produced, and how is the way food is produced affecting the natural world? So before we go further, join me in pausing for a moment and staring this pig in the face. Welcome fellow pig lovers, and welcome to fellow earthworms, because we are all working in the soil of a new economy. An economy that strives to be based less on extraction and consumption and more on preservation and restoration. But there's another kind of creature with us here in this room today, something much bigger than an earthworm or a pig. There's an elephant in the room, and its name is fiduciary responsibility. What is this thing called fiduciary responsibility? If we go all the way back to its roots in ancient Rome, a fiducia was a pledge of property between a borrower and a lender. Zooming to mid-19th century America, the foundation of what would become known as the Proof Man Rule was laid down in Harvard College versus Amory in 1830. I was hoping the pig would stay up there most of the time. <laughs> Just as Samuel Putnam defined a trustee's responsibility. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for that. Justice Samuel Putnam defined a trustee's responsibility to, quote, observe how men of prudence, discretion, and intelligence manage their own affairs, not in regard to speculation, but in regard to the permanent disposition of their funds, considering the probable income as well as the probable safety of the capital to be invested, unquote. Let's keep zooming towards the present all the way to 1989. I'm sitting in a New York City conference room at Alliance Capital, a multi-billion dollar gatekeeper for the venture capital industry. My audience is one Tony Hoberman, an Alliance Capital partner, and he states, I have a moral obligation to my investors to maximize return and minimize risk. It would be a breach of my fiduciary responsibility to take any exogenous social or environmental factors into account. Oh. I'll never forget his use of the words moral and exogenous. For the fiduciary charged with allocating billions of dollars of venture capital, minimizing risk and maximizing return rises to the level of moral responsibility. Are we, are we really to conclude that making less money through the inclusion of social and environmental concerns is immoral? Or that keeping money zooming around the planet as fast as possible in the name of efficiency and competitive returns is synonymous with morality? If you hurt people deliberately, George Soros has said, that's immoral. If you break the law, that's immoral. If you play by the rules, then the market itself is amoral. I'm no expert in ethics, but it seems to me that a competent morality would widen our responsibility and affection rather than narrowing them. So when the stewards of the largest pools of capital on the planet put a veil of amorality around their decision making, where does that leave us? Looking back, I can see now that the first seeds of what would one day become slow money were sown in those words of Tony Hoberman. I have a moral obligation to my investors to maximize return and minimize risk. It's been more than 24 years since that conversation, and during that time, the reign of 19th and 20th century concepts of fiduciary responsibility has continued unbroken. The grip of buy low, sell high has never been stronger. Television ads show infants in their cribs trading stock on their iPads, and I know we've all seen that ad. Anybody who has a TV has seen that. This is cute and funny up to a point, but up to another point, it is a horrible testimony to the colonization of every aspect of culture by the trading mentality. There has been significant progress in assets under management by socially responsible mutual funds and investment advisors, and some of the leaders of socially responsible investing and impact investing are in the room with us today. At the same time, the hegemony of the Dow Jones Industrial Average as the key measure of progress has never been greater. So at this point, I need to ask, how many people in this room have never heard Bobby Kennedy's quote about GNP and uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and our economic well-being? How many people here have never heard the quote? I'm curious. Great. Most people have heard it. Therefore, I don't have to read it. <laughs> but, no, 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 no. I'm not going to. But, it, but it, may be, it may be the most beautiful thing. I've got too much other stuff to cover, and it's a long quote. But I'm going to direct you to it. If, if you haven't heard it, uh, Google RFK and GNP. It is an amazing quote. 
It ends, but I, I will, I do have the last sentence in here. It says the Dow Jones Industrial Average can tell us everything about America except why we are proud to be Americans. And I'm just telling you, you will not believe it if you've never read this book. It is definitely the most um, profound articulation of the disconnect between economics and our well-being that any public figure has probably ever given in the United States. We did it while he was running for president on the campaign trail. So please check it out. But let's keep going on our little journey through the, through the land of fiduciary responsibility. And let's jump to the current day. John Bogle is the founder of the Vanguard Group, one of the world's largest investment management firms with some $2 trillion of assets. As many of you know, Vanguard was indeed at the vanguard of the creation of index funds, which are designed to buy the market with very low management fees. What's the premise? Well, it's not really a premise at this point, it's experience. It turns out far too many money managers don't beat the market by more than their management fees. I'm sure most people in this room are aware of that. That is, performance net of management fees is often lower than the market index against which that performance is measured. Does anybody realize how crazy that is? <laughs> Why don't we all just shout, that's crazy! That's crazy! <laughs> Turns out these same problems uh, company venture capital, the current venture capital. Given that we're here today to catalyze the flow of funding for, for a bunch of small private companies, or tomorrow I should say, when the, when the deals will be on the stage, it's important that we stare the little piggy of venture capital in the face. All right, are there any venture capitalists in the room? That's very disappointing. I know there are a few at least uh, former venture capitalists in the room. We're not, we don't scapegoat people here. We really don't. Why isn't David Haynes in the room? David, if you're out there watching streaming, I'm mad at you for not being in the room. We're here planting the seeds of something called nurture capital. And we do so in the very large shadow cast by venture capital, whose high-flying, high-tech, capital-intensive methods tend to dominate our sense of the right way to invest in private companies. In May of 2012, the Kauffman Foundation published a report that made transparent the results of its experience investing in 100 venture capital funds over a period of decades. What was the conclusion of the report? The average venture capital fund failed to return investor capital after fees. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Half of the venture capital funds in their portfolio, 50, 50, five zero funds, did not return their capital after fees. Nevertheless, here's what they conclude. This is a quote. The historic narrative of venture capital is a compelling story filled with entrepreneurial heroes, spectacular returns, and life-changing companies. The quest to invest in the next Google, Google, I have trouble saying that. Guarantees that venture capital will retain its allure and glamour even in the face of disappointing results. So the narrative is still so strong and captivates us. There's much we could de deconstruct here about venture capital and the power of stories, but in the interest of time, let's just frame a choice. We can keep putting all our eggs in the basket of venture capital and high tech and globalization, or we can, we can begin putting some of our eggs in the basket of nurture capital. An industry that doesn't quite exist yet, but which I believe we are in the process of seeding. If venture capital is a compelling story filled with entrepreneurial heroes and life-changing companies, then the story we are all writing here today and tomorrow, the story of nurture capital and the stories of the small food entrepreneurs who will grace this stage tomorrow, I think this story, these stories are as compelling as the story of venture capital. Of course, you will all be the judge of that tomorrow. You guys better be good tomorrow. Talking to the entrepreneurs. Which brings us back around to Vanguard founder John Bogle, whose decades of unparalleled fiduciary entrepreneurship have led him to conclusions about finance that make the Kauffman Foundation's report seem reserved. Bogle uses the word croupiers to describe financial intermediaries. And he calls the complexity of today's financial instruments a modern version of alchemy. Those are his words. In the modern age, in the Middle Ages, alchemy was about turning lead into gold. In today's world, alchemy is about turning our money into other people's money, then turning other people's money into bytes of information measured in milliseconds. Bogle concludes by worshiping at the altar of numbers, these are his words, and by discounting the immeasurable, we have in effect created a numeric economy that can easily undermine the real one. 
I would remind you that Bogle is no academician or Occupy Wall Streeter. So this is where our journey through the history of fiduciary responsibility lands us, worshiping at the altar of numbers. It is more than, it's too depressing to just shout out, it's crazy, it's more depressing than that. No. I didn't say it's crazy. <laughs> it is more than a little interesting that Bogle's comparison of the numeric economy to the real economy sounds downright Wendell Berry-esque. That's where it gets interesting. Berry writes about the differences between the human economy and what he calls the great economy. Listen to Wendell Berry. I'm going to have a few uh, juicy Wendell Berry quotes here. The difference between the great economy and any human economy is pretty much the difference between the goose that laid the golden egg and the golden egg. For the goose to have value as a layer of golden eggs, she must be a live goose, and therefore joined to the life cycle, which means that she is joined to all manner of things, patterns, and processes that sooner or later surpass human comprehension. The golden egg, on the other hand, can be fully valued by humans according to kind, weight, and measure, but it will not hatch, and it cannot be eaten. To make the value of the egg fully accountable, then, we must make it golden. We must remove it from life. But if in our valuation of it we wish to consider its relation to the goose, I love this phrase, we have to undertake a different kind of accounting, more exacting, if less exact. We are all here today working in the direction of a different kind of accounting, an accounting that is more exacting, if less exact. It's, uh, no, it's notable and hopeful that both Bogle and Berry point towards values that cannot be quantified. It is important that we see them as connected by a single greater purpose. The inventor of index funds and the poet farmer. The steward of trillions of dollars and the steward of millions of earthworms. Neither the financier alone nor the farmer alone can solve the great problems of our day. So long as Bogle speaks to one constituency and Barry to another, we will not discover a new kind of accounting. And such a new accounting requires a new conversation, one that is nuanced enough, exacting enough, to speak across the silos of expertise that separate us. We need a conversation not only between investors and farmers and fiduciaries and entrepreneurs, but a conversation between those very parts of ourselves, between the part of ourselves that is beholden as we sit here to buy low, sell high, and the part of ourselves that is trying to mature into a more responsible and engaged participant in the great economy. We need an, an, an authentic, nuanced public conversation about what's broken in the food system and the financial system, what's broken in our economy and in our culture. We want to speak in authentic, nuanced terms about both sides of the coin, industrial finance and industrial agriculture, GMOs and CBOs, fast food and slow food, fast money and slow money. This kind of conversation is what we've been hosting in gatherings, large and small, local and national, around the country for the past few years, and I wanted to share with you this morning a few gems from those conversations around the country. Local is the distance the heart can travel. That's what Odessa Piper said after a roaring discussion in Madison about the difficulty to finding local. Is it 50 miles, 100 miles, drivable in a day, a watershed, a bioregion? Local is the distance the heart can travel. A woman in National Guard, whose name I'm sad to say I've not been able to recover, said this. The innate value of this kind of investing is so obvious to me, I don't care how much money I make. We have John Fullerton with us today from the New Economics Institute. He's actually going to be up on the panel um, shortly. And I would say that if there's going to be a new economics, that is going to have to include the concept of innate value. The innate value of this kind of investing is so obvious to me, I don't care how much money I make. What the heck kind of fiduciary responsibility is that? <laughs> right kind. Or is it, or is it morality? <clears throat> then there are the words of our dear friend, Jim Gusso, who is blessing us with her presence today. <laughs> here we go. 